My name is Sean Rice. I'm with the Department of Horticulture in the UK. I'm based here at the Robinson Center. Uh, if you do have questions about this as we go through, um, or if you think of something after this is over, feel free to uh, contact me. My email is just sean.white at uky.edu. And my phone number here is 606 2438 extension 234. And uh, as I said, we're based right here at the Robinson Center for Appalachian Resource Sustainability here in uh, Quicksand. Um, and I have some handouts, which I put right there on the table. Let me hand those out. Pass those around. Um, I'm glad you could make it. Uh, you know, we might think it's getting to be a little bit late in 2012, but in reality, now is the perfect time to be thinking about 2013 for beekeeping. Uh, if we have this earlier in the year, what happens is people get real excited and they try and jump into it too late in the year. Whereas this time of year, we've still got time for everybody to put their Christmas wish list together and uh, get things out there. So. Uh, you can uh, hopefully find some bee equipment under your Christmas tree on Christmas morning or something. And in reality, too, in terms of ordering bees and that, most companies don't start taking orders for bees if you're going to order a package of bees until January, usually the first week in January. But uh, usually by the end of February, they're sold out. Uh, so this is really, we found, the ideal time to talk about an introduction to beekeeping uh, project. Anybody here currently a beekeeper? Okay, we've got some, and uh, we've got some new bees, so that's that's good. Uh, that's what we like. Uh, again, feel free to ask questions as we go along. It's better than listening to me stand up here and lecture on for an hour or so. Um, the first question that we usually come to with beekeeping is, ooh, I mean, we've got a pretty diverse group here in the audience, but basically anyone can be a beekeeper whether you live in an urban setting, whether you live in a rural setting, uh, this is actually a uh, picture from Brazil, and it's real interesting. It doesn't show up well in this image, but that's a smoker that that person is holding right there. It's actually about this size. It's a huge smoker compared to what most beekeepers here in the U.S. use. Uh, anything from young children to uh, more seasoned adults, men, women, doesn't really matter. Anybody can be a beekeeper. Uh, my son is with us this evening, and he started beekeeping uh, back in kindergarten and things, so uh, he's got a few years under his belt. Uh, he's still not ready to start doing all the heavy lifting yet, but I'm looking forward to the day when he is, make, make it a little bit easier for me. But even heavy lifting doesn't have to be an issue, uh, because there are different ways that we can keep bees that, uh, you know, you don't have to be a weightlifter in order to do this. Uh, if you do it in some ways, it does help if you are a weightlifter. And as we go along, I'll give you my own personal bias on this. And you know, they always say that if you get two beekeepers in a room, you'll end up with about five opinions because they'll come in with their own opinion. They'll start to talk with each other, and then they'll argue or discuss in a loud manner with each other and change their opinions. So uh, there is no single right way to keep bees. Uh, there's some things that you can do that don't work as well as others. But uh, there's no single one way that's best to keep bees. It's whatever works best for you. And I'm going to present a couple of different options here as we go along. Uh, but just while well, we've got the slide up, you can see your standard Langstroth hive here. And this is a top bar hive. And I have some examples here in the room that I'll show you as we go along as well. Uh, this always comes up, so we might as well deal with it right from the beginning. If you keep bees, you will get stung. I mean, that happens. Uh, it's a normal part of beekeeping. You don't necessarily have to get stung multiple times or every time you go out and work your bees. Uh, different activities that you do with your bees, you're more prone to get stung than other things. Uh, my own personal experience is anytime I'm trying to do anything with my bees at night, uh, there are a few times when you want to do things with your bees at night, like if you want to move your hives or something that's typically done at night when the bees are all back in the hive. Uh, you're also much more likely to get stung then because all the bees are back in the hive and it's really uh, unsettling to the bees if you're moving them and the bottom board falls off. They really don't like that. And I've found uh, 
from personal experience that if there's any holes in your bee suit or in your veil or anything, uh, they seem to particularly find those at night and find their ways in. And uh, having a bee in your veil at night is not a real pleasant experience. But you will get stung. People always say, well, I could get killed by keeping bees. And you could, but uh, the average statistics um, from the uh, medical center where I told this from, there's about 50 deaths per year in the United States from all bees, from all insect stings. That's honeybees, wasps, yellow jackets, ants, uh, not just honeybees. Honeybees are not as aggressive as, say, your ground-dwelling yellow jackets or other things. So, you know, basically one death per state per year on average happens, and that isn't just from honeybees, that's from all insects combined. So you will get stung, it's just part of beekeeping, but we need to address that up front. Normally, this is considered a normal reaction. There's a sting site right in the palm of the hand, a little bit of red swelling around there, itches a little bit sometimes. That's considered a normal reaction. That's not anything unusual, nothing to be really worried about. Even this is considered a normal reaction. It looks a lot worse than it is. This is called a large local reaction. You can see this person's hand is much more swollen, or here their leg is entirely swollen. That, again, is a normal reaction. Sometimes that happens with people. Uh, it's not unusual. Uh, sometimes it depends upon what the bees have been foraging on. Certain times of year, the venom is more potent than other times of year. Uh, so if you see that, again, it's kind of scary looking and it's uncomfortable. Trust me, if your hand is swollen up like that, you want to get your rings off. It's always a good idea if you're out working your bees, take off your rings in case you do get stung and you have a reaction like that, because it's better than having to have your rings cut off or something. Uh, but just kind of keep that in mind. But that's also a normal reaction. This is what you really want to worry about if uh, you know that you're allergic to bee stings. Even if you are allergic to bee stings, you can still keep bees. Uh, I would recommend anybody that's going to start keeping bees just has a standard physical with your doctors. Uh, not, you, know, you can always address the allergy issue, but also just the physical labor involved in beekeeping. Uh, now that deer season has opened in Kentucky, uh, we're going to be hearing more about guys that are out hunting. They get a deer and they decide to drag it three quarters of a mile through the woods and have a heart attack or things like that. They just, they're just not in shape. I mean, there is some strenuous exercise involved with beekeeping. It doesn't have to be really strenuous. You can do things to minimize the activity, but there still is lifting and exercise involved. So have a good checkup before you get involved. Talk to your doctor. But if you have what is called an anaphylactic reaction, this is less than 1% of all bee stings would cause this type of reaction. Uh, I've never had anything like this at all myself, but common symptoms are difficulty breathing, hives that spread beyond the area of the sting. If you get stung on your hand and all of a sudden your chest starts breaking out in hives and you get a large reaction there, or if you get stung on your lower leg, uh, bees, you know, depending upon how you have your suit tucked in and things, uh, bees sometimes like to crawl up your leg and sting you on your ankle and things. So if you get stung on your ankle and all of a sudden your arm starts to itch or something, that's when you start to get concerned. Anytime you have swelling in the face, throat, mouth, tissue, wheezing, difficulty breathing, rapid pulse, that's when you're starting to have an anaphylaxis, an anaphylactic reaction. Those are the type that are very serious. But what you can do, uh, they do have something called an EpiPen. This is just a shot that you give yourself in your leg. And you know, it will enable you to get to the doctors. What I always like to do myself is if I'm gonna be out working the bees and that, I like to just have a bottle of children's Benadryl with me. Uh, Benadryl is a good antihistamine. I mean, if I get stung once, I'm not gonna worry about it. But if you get stung multiple times, if you get eight or nine stings, if you're moving your hive, if you drop the soup or something and all the bees all of a sudden attack you and uh, they get through your suit, it's a good idea just to have some of that Benadryl, especially the liquid Benadryl available. You know, this isn't medical advice, I'm not a physician, but this is what I do. You know, you can take some Benadryl that will enable you, hopefully, to slow down any type of allergic reaction. And then it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to get checked out, or at least have somebody monitor you 
Uh, beekeeping can be done by an individual. You don't have to have a partner, but it's more fun if you do have a partner out there working the bees with you. And that way, if one person gets stung, you can always laugh at that person and say, ah, it was your turn this time. Uh, so, you know, that, that's something. Uh, the EpiPens, uh, you do need a prescription for those. They usually last, I think, for two or three years before they expire. Uh, but you can get that if you do know that you are prone to allergies. If you already know that you're allergic to bee stings, I would recommend having a medical alert bracelet with you or something. You know. You are going to get stung, but that doesn't mean that every reaction is going to cause a problem. And also, there are beekeepers that have been out there keeping bees for years and years, get stung every year, no problem, and then just occasionally one time you get stung and you have a reaction. Uh, you know, that's just the risks of life that happen. I mean, it's like driving a car, you know, you can drive down the road any number of days and then just that one day a deer jumps out in front of you and you hit it. You know, it's not that you've done anything wrong, it's just the nature of life, the way things happen sometimes. Um, so we've talked about that, it does happen. I uh, don't want to dwell on it because as I said, there's less than 50 deaths per year in the United States from all insects things, so it's unusual. Uh, what, just while we're talking about allergic reactions, just an interesting side note, is the people that have the most problems with bee allergies actually, are beekeepers families, the commercial beekeeper families, not the ones that are actually out there moving the bees, doing the migratory beekeeping or that, but it's the ones, the uh, wives and children of the beekeepers, because these beekeepers bring their suits home and things, they throw them in the wash with the other clothes, and the family isn't getting exposed to the stings or things, but they're being exposed to the uh, antigen that causes the allergic reaction. Uh, so, you know, myself, uh, we'll talk more about suits as we go on and things. Uh, this one isn't my specific suit, but my suit doesn't look much better than this. But, you know, the beekeepers that have the nice, pretty white suits probably aren't doing much beekeeping. Uh, this is more what a bee suit should look like. And what you can do with them, I particularly like the cotton ones, because on a rainy day, just hang them outside in the rain, uh, throw some soap on them, scrub it up, and let them get washed that way. You don't even have to throw in the washing machine and not even worry about it. So they dry and, you know, a good suit will last you for many years. So just something to think about there as well. Where, anywhere, in the state of Kentucky, Owensboro is the only place that I could find that has any uh, legislation regulating beekeeping. And theirs is an unenforced law in Owensboro. Uh, in other states, uh, depending upon where they're at and that, people are starting to regulate everything more and more, and uh, people are getting worried about beekeeping. Well, my neighbor's going to put up a beehive, they shouldn't be allowed to do that, and then they go to the city ordinance and say, I could get stung, and in reality, most of the stings that people get aren't from honeybees, they're from wasps and yellow jackets and hornets and things like that, they're not honeybees. Uh, as we talk more, um, Honeybees, they have a barbed stinger on them. So when a honeybee stings you, the stinger actually rips out some of the entrails and the venom sac, and the honeybee is going to die when it stings you. So, you know, it's a last resort for a honeybee to sting you. They don't like to sting you. Uh, my son and I have been out working the bees before, and the bees will come along and they'll actually just come up and bump into your veil and things. Uh, you know, the, usually myself, when I go out, uh, what I will talk about is the equipment here that I think is necessary versus what's nice to have versus what's more designed to catch the beekeeper's eye than anything else. But myself, pretty much just about any time I'm out, I'm going to wear a veil. I mean, if I'm just going to, if I'm going to open the hive up, I'm going to have a veil on. But if I'm just going to be changing the entrance feed or if I'm just going to be looking to see whether the bees are coming in and out like I think they should be, I may or may not wear a veil. And in a case like that, uh, the bees sometimes will come up and will just kind of tap you on the forehead to get your attention. They won't sting you, but they, they like to headbutt you and get your attention and say, you know, get away from my hive before I sting you. They don't want to sting you because, you know, death is a pretty unpleasant thing for a bee. Uh, it's a pretty unpleasant thing for everybody, but, you know, for a bee, that, that is the end of their life. Uh, unlike a yellow jacket, they don't have a barb stinger, they can sting you multiple times. Uh, so that's why yellow jackets are much more aggressive than a honeybee. Also, different races, we'll talk about races of honeybees as we go on. 
different races of honeybees can be more aggressive than other types as well. Uh, when, as I mentioned, now is the best time to start thinking about beekeeping, uh, because if we wait and do this in the spring, it's too late to order your bees, so then you have more expense because you would have to buy what's called a nucleus colony or buy a hive from somebody else. Whereas now, you can start thinking about getting a package. Uh, now is when you can find a mentor. Now is when you can put your Christmas wish together. Uh, you can start reading up online on the different forums. We have several schools that are coming up here in Kentucky that uh, happen between January and March. So now is the ideal time to start thinking about this. Certainly any time is an acceptable time to be keeping bees. Uh, we always need more beekeepers. We're an aging group. The average age of beekeepers, just like most farmers, runs around mid-50s to early 60s. Used to be a time when everybody had a beehive on their farm. But how many people farm anymore, honestly? Uh, so, you know, we're getting fewer and fewer beekeepers. One thing that uh, we're thinking about here in Breathitt County, uh, I'll just mention that because we're based here right now, is uh, we're thinking about trying to get a 4-H club that's involved in beekeeping started. Uh, so if anybody's interested in that, you can contact Jessica Mullins, a 4-H agent here. Uh, we're going to be seeing how much interest we have and if there's any experienced beekeepers out there that want to volunteer to help out with that as well. Uh, we're always looking for experienced beekeepers. Because if we don't start training the younger generation about keeping bees, this is like everything else. It's going to be a dying art. Nobody's going to remember how to do it. Also, there's a tradition among beekeepers that when a beekeeper dies, they go out and they turn the beehive slightly. Not the dead person, of course, but uh, the, the, the person that the beekeeper was mentoring. And that's called telling the bees. And that's uh, just tradition to let the bees know that their keeper has died and their world has changed a little bit. And so, you know, if you are a beekeeper and you're not mentoring somebody, there's not going to be anybody to tell your bees when you go on to that great uh, apiary in the sky. So, you know, get out there, work with the youth. The youth are the future of America. And if we don't work with them, uh, I hate to think where we're going to end up at. Why? Uh, just as a general show of hands here, who's interested in honey? Who likes honey? Okay. Pollination, anybody garden interested in pollination? How about wax, pollen, propolis, anybody crafting? Okay, relaxation, just hobby interest. It's, yeah, it's kind of fun. Uh, you know, I, I always like to go out and work with my bees. I found that when I'm out working my bees, people tend to leave me alone quite a bit. So uh, that, that's, that's real nice as well. But uh, this slide just shows some of the different types of honey. There's different varieties of honey. Uh, depending upon how you keep your bees, if there's one thing in bloom at a specific time, there's a big push in eastern Kentucky now just to uh, produce sourwood honey up on the mine sites and things uh, after they've come in and reclaimed that plant, those with sourwood trees. And then because the bees will actually work one type of flower at a time if something is in bloom, and that's how they produce these varietal honeys. So if the clover is in honey, or clover, if the clover is in bloom at a certain time, and the bees start working that, they will just work the clover as long as that is in bloom, and then they'll go to the next thing in bloom. And different honeys have different flavors; they have different characteristics. Uh, myself, I like buckwheat honey. That would be one of your darker honeys. It has a little bit stronger flavor. I like it. I like orange blossom honey. It has a very unique flavor. I'm not a big fan of clover honey. I think it's kind of mild for my taste, but there are people that like that as well. Um, goldenrod honey is something that if you have a good fall flow, uh, the bees can really pack that away. But if they've been doing that, you can walk by the hive and it smells like old gym socks. And that's, you know, you know that they've been working that. Uh, it's not necessarily the best tasting honey either, and it definitely has an odor, and it crystallizes a lot quicker than other types. Some types of honey will crystallize quicker than other types as well. Uh, just because it crystallizes, that's not a big thing to be concerned about. Uh, myself, I don't like to heat my honey up too much because it breaks down some of the enzymes and things that are in it. Uh, but if you just warm up a pan of water to about 110 degrees or so, you can put your jar of honey in there and uh, that'll warm it up and it'll go back into solution, break up those crystals as well. Um, 
pollination is the main reason I first got into beekeeping. Uh, we were doing some research when I worked for Ohio State University, and we were running into issues with our uh, fruit and vegetable research, not getting the yields we wanted because we didn't have enough bees around, so we started keeping bees to get better results with our garden. And, uh, you know, there are bees out there. Honey bees aren't the only thing that pollinate crops. There's orchard bees and mason bees and squash bees, uh, leaf cutter bees. Lots of different types of bees can pollinate crops. Honey bees are the most efficient pollinators of most crops. Not all crops, however. Bumblebees are actually a better pollinator of blueberries. Just the way the blueberry flower is designed where it hangs down and the structure of it. Uh, also, bumblebees will start working flowers earlier in the day. They'll work harder when it's raining uh, than a honeybee will, but they don't pack away as much honey as a honeybee does. That's why we don't keep bumblebees for uh, honey production or anything else. But in terms of pollination, they're very good. Uh, in an orchard, you sometimes see these straws that they're sold in the garden catalogs for orchard bees and things, very efficient pollinators and things. Uh, but that's one reason we got into it. Um, typically when you keep bees, there's times that you will have extra wax produced. That you say, well, what should I do with it? You can melt that down, you can sell it to somebody, you can sell it to these bee, bee companies, they'll buy your wax from you to make what's called foundation for uh, your frames and things. Uh, you can make lip balm, you can do all sorts of different things with it, crafts, candles, or uh, different things. Um, observation hives, sometimes you see those around. Um, I've never kept an observation hive myself. They require quite a bit more management, uh, but that's something that some people like to do as well. And just just having bees around, uh, some people find that very relaxing as well. So you can see there's as many reasons why as there are beekeepers out there, and how there are as many different ways as there are beekeepers and reasons for keeping bees. This is my typical setup. I'll give you my bias right now and explain why I like this. Uh, but that doesn't mean that this is what you should do. Your goals might be different than mine. Uh, I like eight frame medium boxes, and I've got one of those that I'll show to you as we go along here. Um, more as we talk about how the thing is kept. I like a screened bottom board. There's also solid bottom boards. Uh, queen includer. They're typically called queen excluders, but I've never used them for that purpose. Casual indifference. Uh, I don't neglect my bees. If they need treatment, if they need medication, I will use medication on them. If I have to, I prefer not to. Uh, I don't, I'm not doing it for maximum honey production, however, either. Uh, I'm into it for some honey production, I'm into it for the pollination as well, and the recreational thing. Treat when necessary, survivor stock. Uh, I like to let my bees raise their own queen whenever possible. Uh, if I capture a swarm, I like to let them have their own queen and things, and if they need to, to rear their own queen, uh, just because I find that the locally uh, bred queens are a little hardier. I'm, I'm aiming for hardy stock that can take care of itself. I figure if I have to take care of myself, my bees need to take care of themselves. I don't want to work, raise bees that uh, have to be pampered and uh, fed all the time and everything else. Uh, no mean bees. My wife won't let me keep mean bees around because she doesn't want the kids getting stung and I'm not particularly fond of getting stung myself as well. Uh, pollination, recreation, and a little honey. So that, that's my own bias and we'll talk about the different types of setups as we go along here. This is how beekeeping used to be done uh, with an old skep made out of straw or a bee gum where they cut a section of a tree out and the bees lived in that. Neither one of those are legal anymore. Uh, there are disease issues with bees and you need to be able to examine the individual frames uh, that the bees will draw out. This, when uh, Reverend Langstraw first discovered the concept of bee space, that's what enabled us to really progress in the beekeeping industry from something like this to what you see more typically in a uh, orchard now with the stacks of the white boxes and things because he discovered that the bees always drew their comb out in a certain distance away from each other. And by designing the boxes that way, that's uh, enabled the advances in beekeeping that we've come up with. We do have options. This is called a top bar hive. I have 
a partial top bar hive here set up. And uh, you can look at this when we're done here if you want. But the basic concept of this, this is a very inexpensive way to keep bees. I like it. This would be my recommendation for somebody who wants just a little bit of honey and is more interested in pollination and things like that. Very inexpensive. You've got a couple of 1x12s here and um, just a couple of small boards. And what you do is you put the bees in the box. They will draw out their comb on these pieces of wood and they live in that little box right there. The drawback to this is that there's not a lot of people that use these setups. There is information now uh, on the internet on this. There's some good sites out there and there's some references in the handout for you. Uh, myself, I think it's pretty interesting. I changed the design of that box a little bit, but I can certainly talk to you about modifications to that as well. But you can see that's a very simple setup. You don't really need much at all to keep bees with this type of setup. You would have a couple of pieces of 1 by 12, a, a few of these triangular pieces of wood that they would draw the uh, comb out on, and you need a long knife and a bucket to collect your comb in. Because when you work this, there's actually just a piece of plywood or masonite or whatever you want to put on top of this. But with this type of setup, you don't even need to use a veil because when you work these types of hives, you only draw one frame at a time. They're a little bit more fragile, they're more prone to breaking because there is no frame around it like there would be with a Langstroth type hive where the foundation is inside the frame. Uh, the difference being here you're only pulling out, this is all the exposed bee space that you have, so you're not going to have a lot of bees flying out of that hive, unlike with a uh, standard box. Then when you take the top off of this box, you've got all this space for bees to come out and decide to pay you a visit from. Um, but as I said, when it, you're using a top bar hive, the way that you do this is you the bees draw out their comb on the frame on the uh, bar. You come along with your knife, you cut it off into a five-gallon bucket, you take it back, you crush it, you strain it, and you've got your honey and you've got some wax. Very inexpensive. You don't need an extractor or a veil or anything else. Very inexpensive. You could build one of these top bar hives for you know less than fifty dollars. A standard Langstroth setup like that could run you two hundred and fifty dollars or so by the time you get everything you need for that. Uh, bees are going to cost you the same whichever type of box you keep. But uh, one thing I'd like to mention too, as well as I think about right now, is I would never recommend keeping just one hive. Because if you have one hive, what do you have to compare it against? Is it doing good? Is it doing bad? You just really don't know. So it might, you know, ideally you would always have two hives, because then you have something to compare them against. I mean, they could both be doing poorly. But you say, well, I don't see any difference between they could both be doing well, or one could be doing good, and one could be doing poorly. Then you could say there's something wrong with the hive that's not doing well. Um, so normally, I <clears throat> I recommend two hives as a way to start out. Um, so there are different options. I've already told you my biases. Um, top bar hives are certainly good. If you keep hives in a Langstroth hive, this type of hive right here, an average yield per, in a normal year in Kentucky, is 50 pounds of honey per year. You know, that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you don't love honey, you don't have a lot of friends and neighbors, 50 pounds of honey can add up quickly if you have a couple of good years. Uh, you know, some years you're not going to have a good year, and you, you know, you won't get anything. This year we pulled very little honey at all pulled just enough for 4-H uh, entry at the state fair and that was it. But on average, 50 pounds of honey per year from this type of hive. You know, this type of hive, you're looking more at 5 or 10 pounds. You know, you can certainly take as much as you want. But this isn't going to be nearly as productive because when you cut that comb off, the bees have to draw that comb out again. Whereas with this type of setup, you actually remove the capping is off of the frame, put this in an extractor, spin it around, the honey comes out, and then you put this back in your box, and the bees don't have to draw out all that wax again. Wax production is very energy intensive for the bees. Uh, 
So just something to think about there as well. Uh, Dr. Jim Tu, who used to be the extension beekeeping specialist for Ohio State University, said that the main reason that most people get out of beekeeping is because they don't know what to do with all the honey they've got. Uh, you know, you've got different options. Certainly you can sell it. Uh, you can make mead with it if you like to do that sort of thing, honey, wine. Uh, so, you know, there are different options, but that's the main reason he always told me that most people got out of keeping bees. These are some really good references on top of our hives. Bush farms, uh, you know, I don't have any commercial interest in any of these setups or anything else. This would be the one I would go to first. That's where the design for this box actually came from. Uh, you can see on this one, this actually isn't a bush design, but they actually put a plexiglass window in there. I've seen these built out of hardwood. Uh, we just use cheap pine to build us. So you can make it as fancy as you want with a little plexiglass window that you put a board over and then you can take it off and peek in there and see what your bees are doing. You know, you have a lot of different options, but there are resources out there, but if you're going to keep bees this way, you're going to have a harder time finding somebody locally that can mentor you and how to keep bees that way. People always say, well, it gets too cold here to keep bees that way. Uh, Michael Bush, who has done a lot of this, he's actually in Nebraska. And Nebraska gets colder than eastern Kentucky, and he's done it successfully. There's other beekeepers that I've communicated with on the Internet that are in Wyoming and places like that. So, uh, you know, you can keep bees in a top bar hive and things. Um, as far north as, you know, probably up into New England and things. Uh, typically lower honey production, harder to get advice from experienced beekeepers. You can't really swap the bars out from hive to hive. In your standard Langstroth hive, these are all the same size. Uh, but in a top bar hive, the bees are a little bit more prone to draw things a little wavy and a little bit crooked and things. Whereas in a Langstroth hive, they draw it out nice and flat on here in an ideal world. Uh, so you have more options in swi switching them out. That's one of my own personal biases in keeping things in an eight frame medium because some beekeepers will talk about the brood boxes and things in a minute, but myself, if you keep everything in a medium, you don't have the dis different size frames. I could take a uh, medium frame anywhere from a brood box up into a honey super or anywhere else and put it around. Whereas if you use what are, is typically thought of as a uh, typical setup, you would have your bees in a brood box that would be a deep, and then you put your honey in a shallow super. And the uh, deep frames are much different size than a shallow. Uh, I like to simplify things and keep them as simple as possible myself. Um, you know, combs are more fragile, more difficult to move. Uh, a little bit more skill, you, you know, you don't have the heavy lifting. Uh, we'll talk about the weight of uh, supers and things as we go on. You don't have to worry about extractors, it's inexpensive. Um, so people that are really into beekeeping more for the pollination aspects, that's the way that I would steer them myself. Langstroth Hive, more honey production, more experienced beekeepers, more flexibility. Uh, this is what you see when the bees are loaded on flatbed trucks being trucked out to California to pollinate the almond crops in uh, January and February. They load these up on a truck and uh, I forget exactly off the top of my head what the statistics are, but uh, it's somewhere over 60 to 70 percent. It's higher than that, but of the bees that are kept commercially in the United States actually spend time in California in the early year to pollinate the almond crop. Uh, and then they get loaded on another truck and truck somewhere else to pollinate another crop. There is money to be made in producing honey. Uh, typically, in a good year, you're going to have excess and you're going to do real well. In a bad year, you're not going to make anything. You're going to have still have expenses. On average, with honey production, you can make enough that it uh, covers your costs as a hobby and you'll have a little bit of profit in your pocket. But the main way to make money in bees is actually in pollination. You load them up on a flatbed and you truck them around the United States and you pollinate different crops. In a good year, in the almond crop in California, you could rent 
one single hive just for the uh, few weeks that it spends in the almond crops, you can get $200 per hive in a good year. In a bad year, you might get $80 per year per hive. But you know, there's a lot of money to be made there uh, if it works well. But uh, myself, I don't feel like trucking around the United States with a load of bees behind me. But uh, you know, that's the money is really in the pollination, and I'll tell you that up front. But there is some money to be made in honey, uh, certainly in the craft things, the lip bulbs and the candles and the crafty things and that. You can make money that way. And in addition, there's just the benefit that you get from the bees pollinating your crops, so you get higher yields from your garden. Um, parts of a hive, uh, this is just kind of an exploded view of a hive, and we'll go over all the different parts as we go here. And we'll start out simply with a hive stand. Myself, uh, the idea of a hive stand is to get the hive off the ground, just because any time you've got wood sitting on the ground, it's going to potentially rot uh, to discourage raccoons and skunks. Raccoons and skunks love honeybees, so they'll come up and scratch at your hive and uh, like to eat the bees when they come out. But if they have to kind of get up on their hind paws a little bit, it exposes the underbelly, and then they're more prone to getting stung, and they don't like that. Uh, if you use a screen bottom board, you have that stand to allow some ventilation to scourge ants. Uh, myself, I've never seen a hive in the wild that has a nice sloped landing board or anything like that. I would never buy a hive stand like that myself. Uh, my own preference uh, for a hive stand myself is something more like this, just a couple of concrete blocks, and I put my hives just sitting right on a concrete block. It's cheap, but it's indestructible, and uh, you know you can move it around or whatever. This person here has them on simply a pole, uh, looks a little unstable to myself. This is a nice one because they've cleaned out an area, and they've built it out of treated lumber. They've stacked their hives along that. This one anybody recognize?